Good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to do a quick check. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to Green RE's Sustainability Webinar Series, Episode 5, Towards Net Zero Green Buildings. I hope everyone is doing well in this extended FMCO period. I see quite a number of familiar faces on our RSVP list. Welcome back. Before we get started, I would like to go through some housekeeping um, announcements to ensure that you can interact with myself and the speakers. We have the open chat feature enabled. If you wish to ask questions, please post your questions in the chat box with your name and organization. Please also ensure that your mics are turned off until the Q&A session to avoid interruptions. Also, Green RE accredited professionals are eligible to Green RE CPD points. Please fill in the survey form at the end of the webinar for us to record your attendance. For those who are new to Green RE, here's a short video introducing Green RE. Right, just to update everyone, Green RE is also supporting the Climate Governance Initiative and the CEO Action Network to organize a series of roundtables with private and public sector to discuss policy action necessary to accelerate Malaysia's 
progress towards decarbonizing the building sector. Here is uh, the advert for the upcoming event. Please join us for this session in July. The link to the RSVP page will be posted in the chat group after this. Back to today's agenda. Net zero carbon is when greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere can be balanced by their removal over a specific time period. The Paris Agreement has set this goal at 2050. For real estate, this means that carbon emissions as a result of all activities associated with the development, ownership and servicing of buildings are zero or negative. Can we afford to do these things? More importantly, can we afford not to? Which brings us to our panelists today. We have four very, very uh, sorry, we have four established speakers from Singapore and Malaysia and also Australia to provide an insight on the experience so far uh, towards these goals. First up, we have Ms. Yvonne So, who is the Executive Director of Singapore Green Building Council, SGBC, an industry organization driving the transformation of Singapore's built environment. Yvonne is a registered professional civil engineer and a Green Mark accredited professional. She was previously with Singapore's BCA, Building and Construction Authority of Singapore, where she headed the Center for Sustainable Buildings and managed portfolios in policy development, regulatory control, industry promotion, and R&D. I will now hand it over to you, Yvonne. Thank you. Okay, let me find my PowerPoint. Okay, do you see the full screen? Yes, we do. Okay, yep. Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be here to share with you about what's happening in Singapore. Uh, so I titled my presentation with a question because um, what comes to mind when you're thinking of a zero energy building? So for me, this is the image that comes to my mind when I think of a zero energy building. And this is the beautiful zero carbon building in Hong Kong developed by the Construction Industry Council and the Hong Kong administration. So essentially, I associate net zero buildings with a squat and a low rise uh, structure that has a large roof covered with solar panels. So it's not exactly the kind of building that Singapore as a highly urbanized and dense city state is known for. So when I got an email from uh, Jonita and Ashwin, to give a talk about zero energy buildings, my first reaction was, uh, no way. You don't want to hear from Singapore. It's just not possible for Singapore's buildings to get to net zero. We don't even have enough space to fit in all the buildings that we need. And we're not just looking at going upwards. We're also exploring building downwards into underground spaces. In fact, space is such a precious commodity that, look, we even have to hang our laundry outside of buildings to dry. So where will we find the space for solar panels to generate the clean energy for us to get to net zero? We can't count on any other forms of clean energy as all the other forms of alternative energy such as wind or hydro are just not feasible for Singapore. Well, a study was led by the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore to look deeply into the potential areas for solar deployment and assess the absolute potential for solar energy in Singapore. This study was first conducted in 2014 and uh, recently updated and republished last year. So where will our solar energy come from? Firstly, the obvious choice. 
rooftops are of course the most natural place that we think of when we want to install solar panels. However, rooftop space is also used for many other things, such as water tanks, uh, cooling towers, your lift motor rooms, rooftop gardens, and also the very latest growing interest in rooftop farming. So after considering all of these factors, how much of the roof space do we have left over? So this is the typical availability of uh, space left over on the roofs of various types of buildings that can potentially be used to install solar panels. As you can see from the table, industrial roofs are the most promising, having typically 60% of their roof area free of uh, encumbrances, whilst commercial buildings offer the least bare space. So the total rooftop areas across Singapore that can be utilized for solar deployment was assessed to be 13.2 square kilometers, with approximately 60% of this usable area coming from industrial buildings and only 12.5% from commercial buildings. Other than the rooftop, where else can you install solar panels in a building? Yes, the facade, of course. The walls of the building can be another surface for solar deployment. And this could be through a building added photovoltaics or BAPV for short, or building integrated photovoltaics uh, or BIPV for short. So the main difference between BAPVs and BIPVs is that BAPVs consists of fitting modules to existing surfaces usually as a retrofit, whereas BIPVs involve the replacement of the traditional building element with materials uh, incorporating solar modules. For example, as glazing or cladding, it becomes part of the aesthetic identity of the building. So deploying solar onto building facades would add 9.8 square kilometers to the potential solar deployment area. Well, even though our tiny island is chock-a-block with buildings, there are still many areas and pockets of land that are vacant. And I don't mean uh, natural spaces or nature reserves. Uh, these are areas of undeveloped land that have been earmarked for future development or reserved for certain purposes, but are not needed for that purpose yet, at least not for now. So these land areas can be used for temporary solar deployment. The solar installations, however, have to be done in a way that can be easily removed within a certain period of time and in a cost-effective manner. Uh, based on an analysis of satellite images, the study found that such temporary land areas could contribute up to five square kilometers to Singapore's total solar deployment area. So, so far we've looked at uh, building rooftops, building facades and land, what could be next? So that would be water. Solar systems can be deployed on water bodies. And these are known as floto a floating photovoltaics or flotavoltics. Such systems can be deployed in either freshwater, specifically the reservoirs in Singapore's case, or in seawater, which means offshore of Singapore, but within our territorial waters. So both types of systems were recently installed successfully earlier this year in different parts of Singapore. The deployment of solar on water bodies will add about 4.6 square kilometers to the total potential area for solar deployment. So don't you think it's amazing how you can find space when you really need to? And uh, I'm not quite done yet. There's still one more area that the researchers looked into. The last one on the list is known as infrastructure PV. So this refers to the dual use of infrastructure assets, such as by constructing solar panel shelters over car park lots, or by construct or, or farming areas, or over roads and canals, or by incorporating solar cells into noise barriers. So by integrating solar into infrastructure assets, we can add another 4.15 square kilometers to Singapore's total solar deployment area. So to put it all together, this is all the space that we can squeeze out to install solar panels in Singapore. 
a total of 36.8 square kilometers, which is about 5% of Singapore's total land mass. So the big question is, how much energy can that generate for us? And would it be enough? Well, if all the areas could be fully utilized, the technical potential for solar power would be 8.6 gigawatt peak in 2050. So I would like to emphasize that this is a technical potential and it's highly unlikely that we will be able to achieve this in real life due to the many competing needs for space and also bearing in mind technological and efficiency considerations. So is 8.6 gigawatt peak enough? Enough to get Singapore to net zero. So what do you think? Actually, we should do a poll at this uh, point in time, but uh, never mind. Unfortunately, it's not a happy ending at all. So after all that scrunching around for space to install solar, using a more realistic scenario-based approach for solar deployment and technology considerations, the likely installed capacity that can be reached in 2050 would be between 2.5 to 5 gigawatt peak, which would meet only about 3.4 to 7.4%, or in other words, an average of 5.4% of Singapore's total annual electricity needs. So for 2030, we are currently on track to install about 2 gigawatt peak of solar energy, which would meet the electricity needs of about 250,000 households or about one quarter of all households in Singapore. So now you understand what a long way we have to go to get to net zero. It looks like a really um, distant and unachievable goal for us at the moment. So of course, we are looking at other uh, initiatives to reduce our grid emissions, but the path ahead is also not easy. Some of these plans uh, include leveraging on multilateral energy trade agreements to tap on uh, regional power grids for clean energy, Malaysia being one, of course, uh, developing low carbon solutions such as carbon capture and utilization, and exploring alternative lower carbon fuel sources such as hydrogen. But since uh, I believe most of you in the audience today are probably from the building sector, so let me spend the next part of my presentation sharing about what the building sector in Singapore is doing to support and get to the net zero long-term goal. So we have just launched our latest green building master plan earlier this year, and it was a joint uh, public-private sector initiative by the Building and Construction Authority together with the Singapore Green Building Council. So after over a year of discussions, we have agreed to work together to achieve these three goals in 2030. Firstly, that 80% of Singapore's buildings will be green by 2030. This is not new and it has been in place since the first master plan about 10 years ago. We are now about 43% into our greening journey. Secondly, from 2030 onwards, 80% of our new buildings must be super low energy. So by super low energy, what this means is that buildings will need to be at least 60% more energy efficient than our buildings were in 2005. Thirdly, in 2030, we want our best-in-class buildings to be at least 80% more energy efficient. This is a research development and innovation target to seek out even better technology solutions and design approaches to reduce the energy consumption of our buildings. So some of the key plans to bring the master plan to life include the launch of a new Greenmark standard known as the Greenmark 2021. It is currently being offered uh, on a pilot status and it will come into force to replace the current Greenmark standard likely towards the end of this year. The requirements in the new standard have been raised significantly for both new developments and existing buildings. And the key change is that the new minimum energy efficiency level is pitched at the current platinum level. So of course, there's 
great concern amongst our industry members on costs, especially as we are all trying to come out of a COVID slump. But a study on the cost benefit of Greenmark projects has shown that certified buildings enjoy net positive savings throughout their life cycle. The upfront capital investment is paid back many times over with further energy savings beyond the payback period. So I'll give you some time to absorb some of the numbers on the screen. So the main message is that that's a strong business case to aim for higher performance and take action that is more aligned with climate change realities. For existing buildings, there will be continued efforts to increase the transparency of building energy performance to the public and to benchmark buildings energy performance against similar building types. Whereas uh, data disclosure was on a voluntary basis in the past, this will be made fully public from this year's data collection onwards. A number of the market leaders in Singapore's real estate sector have gone one step further to support the Singapore Green Building Master Plan and have challenged themselves to work towards a net zero absolute goal to have their assets under direct control to be net zero operational carbon by 2030 and for embodied carbon in their new construction and major renovation to have net zero embodied carbon by 2030. So these are our climate leadership members who have committed to the World Green Building Council's global net zero carbon buildings commitment. So it's uh, heartening to note that more and more businesses are recognizing that the world is just not on track to meet the target of limiting warming to well below two degrees Celsius and have taken upon themselves to lead the way to find solutions that are globally ambitious, yet locally relevant. So earlier this month, uh, one of our members, Capital Land, just set up a 50 million Capital Land Innovation Fund to support the test bidding of sustainability and other high-tech innovations in the built environment space. It's hoped that uh, this will catalyze more innovations and accelerate global sustainability efforts, and to also ensure that the built environment space remains at the forefront of technology for sustainability and climate change goals. Other recent efforts in Singapore to support the transition towards a net zero goal includes the launch of a global exchange and marketplace for high quality carbon credits known as the Climate Impact X or CIX for short. This venture is owned by the Singapore Stock Exchange and banks, DBS and Standard Chartered, backed by Temasek Holdings. The CIX will have two platforms catered to the needs of buyers and sellers, an exchange and a project marketplace. The carbon exchange will facilitate the sale of large-scale, high-quality carbon credits, whilst the Project Marketplace will enable the purchase of high quality carbon credits directly from nature-based projects that conserve, restore, and protect natural ecosystems. So I would like to emphasize that in the hierarchy of efforts, the most important first step is to reduce energy demand and maximize energy efficiency as much as possible. Then you can look into generating renewable energy on site. And if that's not possible, procure it off-site. After you've done all these steps, there is a role for offsets using good quality carbon credits. It helps to direct capital to climate action projects that would not have otherwise taken off. But it is of course important that businesses must first find all means to eliminate or lessen their emissions as much as possible first. So I hope that I have given you an answer to the question on whether or not it's possible for Singapore's buildings to get to net zero. The answer is no, not for now and not for the entire building stock. But we are trying our very best to be ready for a zero emissions grid. And our efforts are centered on reducing the energy demand from buildings 
and operating our buildings in the best, most efficient way possible until the net zero end goal comes within sight with the help of our friends from the energy and power generation sector. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to answering any questions that you might have later. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, you certainly provided a very pragmatic view on Singapore's uh, very ambitious goals, yet very uh, quite an uphill battle that Singapore's facing. So uh, we do have a number of questions, but we'll save it till the end of uh, the session. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Yvonne. So um, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, T.S. Steve Lojuntin from Theda, Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Steve is currently the Director of Energy Demand Management Division, which is responsible for planning, implementing, and monitoring programs related to energy management initiatives under Theda. He is a mechanical engineer by training and an energy manager by practice. He is a qualified GBI facilitator and a committee member of Malaysia's Energy Professional Association. He has uh, previously worked with Keta, with the NIDA for Keta's low energy office building project, and is also involved in the development of Green Tech Malaysia's green energy office. He has provided technical assistance to JKR on energy efficient design improvements for public buildings in Malaysia. And um, to sum up a long list of achievements, he also leads the development of Keta's Green Township Program, LCCF, and CIDB's Construction Industry Standard Green Pass. Okay, so I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Steve. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and here, sorry. Yes. So, okay, I can hear. Okay, can see the slide, right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you and very good afternoon to uh, all. Uh, thanks to Green Ari as an organizer <clears throat> to uh, what they call organize this uh, webinar related to zero energy, which is have uh, related to zero carbon uh, futures by 2050. A lot of country currently looking for that. In fact, uh, our local authority looking for what's for uh, Carbon zero of carbon neutral, so once a and so on. So, <clears throat> my presentation is uh, not and direct uh, what they call concepts, then and also what available in uh, in Malaysia. Eh? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, uh, introductions. I think uh, this first speaker has mentioned about what zero energy, but uh, I always like to uh, iterate that uh, zero energy building is uh, is advanced sustainable energy uh, building, low carbon building. People talking about low carbon now, carbon neutral, and so on. And zero energy building is different than conventional green building because the matrix is different. Uh, green building normally they use uh, several uh, criteria more than energy, uh, like waste, waters, materials, and so on. And zero energy is uh, has different assessment based on quantitative uh, performance. Eh? <clears throat> and also uh, the focus mainly to, on the building operations focus on direct impact on total energy and operational carbon reductions, <clears throat> which is the sustainable energy. In fact, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And uh, zero energy also can be uh, looked as a, what I call towards achieving 100% uh, renewable energy mix or supply to the building. Uh, like uh, we have a, a example, some local authorities now impose like say for example, 30% of renewable energy, meaning to say 30% of uh, renewable energy into the uh, building, but that is to us. But if you do net zero energy building, meaning to say it's 100% renewable energy, yeah? and towards achieving carbon neutral, and uh, focusing on basic, practical, and viable elements in sustainable building, yeah? meaning to say it's a quantitative, measurable, recordable, and reportable. And zero energy building is a global race. A target to make building become super energy efficient, like mentioned by the first speaker just now. At the same time, deployment of on-site renewable energy to achieve uh, ZEP. Eh? Numbers of countries uh, by directive uh, looking, like EU by directive looking for zero energy, Japan, and we also know that our neighbor Singapore uh, also towards that. And in general, like EU and Japan target by 2020, all new public buildings uh, towards zero energy. 
Uh, it doesn't mention must be net energy. It's mentioned zero energy. It can be near zero or net zero. And by 2030, average new building, public and private, also toward, towards uh, net zero. This is to support the carbon net zero carbon program uh, by 2050. Yeah? And we know that from the uh, common carbon metric reports by UNEP SBCI, uh, one third of uh, the global CO2 comes from the building sector in terms of operationals. And then in numbers of uh, program like low carbon, neutral carbon, uh, zero carbon cities program and so on, building sectors offers the highest chance to reduce emissions at affordable uh, cost. That's a quick win. Any cities wanted to go for low carbon, even now carbon neutral, building sector actually is the area that they need to, uh, to look into because that is a quick wins. And currently, there's also development of international standard of zero energy building methodologies under the ISO TC205. It's really it's, uh, really uh, in progress. Eh? And uh, what do you call? Uh, uh, and in 2018, Saudi Malaysia uh, had signed MOU with uh, Japan uh, Business Alliance Smart Energy Worldwide, which is assisted by Energy Conservation Japan. Uh, to embark on promotions of zero energy building and awareness in Malaysia. So you can see that this, there is a photos of how actually we have the program uh, awareness and so on here, here in Malaysia. Eh? Uh, every year we have a seminar every February since 2018 until uh, this year. And this is how Saudi Malaysia start with the, uh, the program. I mean, the zero energy building program. <clears throat> Our formula is very simple. Zero energy building is combination of energy efficiency and renewable energy plus sustainable practices. Because if you design the building to be zero energy, but the practice is not there, then the building might not be able to operate as a zero energy. And at the same time, what I call in Malaysia, we have the uh, zero energy building uh, focus group uh, set up in, two, uh, in 2018. Uh, from various stakeholder and from there every year they will be uh, coming to the uh, workshop of zero energy organized by Saudi Malaysia and uh, GSW. Eh? So <clears throat> most uh, country have its own target to reduce GSG. So the rationale behind on this zero energy is also to support the national's uh, uh, GSG reduction. For example, in Malaysia we have 45% GSG intensity reduction by 2030. Oh, that is the policy, and then further bring further down to uh, another hierarchy, which is the cities. Most cities uh, they have target on reduced carbon, certain percentage, percentage, and so on. And after that, uh, by right, the cities for go for those going for low carbon cities should also implement it to building level, eh? <clears throat> building level sectors on, on zero energy, uh, carbon neutral or zero energy. This is the low carbon cities framework published by uh, uh, the government of Malaysia. Under the low carbon cities uh, uh, framework, there's a four element, urban environment, transportation, infrastructure, and building. And under the building, it's specifically mentioned about low carbon building. And if you look into low carbon building, it's target on the operation carbon. And advanced low carbon building is where the zero energy building uh, sitting. I think uh, this is the uh, uh, fact that uh, published by numbers of internationals, uh, what I call uh, report, including uh, UNEP and uh, WRI. Building sectors offers the highest quick wins to reduce carbon because of uh, by implementing what they call program and enhance the what they call building regulations and so on. So, why it stop? Sorry. Okay, in reality, <clears throat> when, when a city is uh, set is a uh, carbon reductions or uh, and so on, uh, in ideal, ideal what I call a uh, form, actually all sector like transport, building, industry, agriculture, if set, set 45%, all will be set 45%. But in reality, it's it not the same. Some sector have difficulties to reduce carbon and some are actually easy. But from the, what I call the research have been done, building offered the highest chance just now. So in order to make the cities to achieve or what I call the reductions, 
So building sector have to work hard to compensate the other uh, sector that not be able to achieve the reductions. That's why that's the idea how this zero energy uh, building uh, come in. I mean, to help the other sectors to reduce uh, uh, carbon. <clears throat> and the practical uh, solutions to, to make zero carbon, uh, zero energy is, is uh, just look into the pyramid of sustainable energy, meaning to say energy efficiency. Using energy efficiency and energy conservations to reduce the energy uh, demand, the energy consumptions, and the balance offset by uh, renewable energy. Yeah. It is something like a pail of water because energy you can see, but if you use water, people can easily see. This is a pail of water. How you want to maintain the level of water in the, uh, inside the bucket to full? So you need to address first the leakages. Uh, this is where the energy efficiency, energy management, energy conservation, and so on. So if you address the leakages, meaning to say the water you fill up to the bucket it will be a minimum. When the minimum, uh, when the what I call water minimum or in terms of renewable energy is minimum capacity, meaning to say it's safe cost. And in Malaysia, we have a standard uh, we use to, as a reference to, towards energy efficiency and renewable energy. The MS1525 code of practice use of EE and RE for non residential building to make the building uh, optimize energy efficiency. And the renewable energy, BIPV solar, MS1837. For the uh, for, for the uh, solar photovoltaics eh? and on operations, there is a standard ISO 15000 or using MS Energy Management. And <clears throat> under the TC 205, currently developed by ISO, still in progress, they suggest six core elements for standardizations of zero energy. Yeah, actually six elements. First, actually at the planning, there must be a planning stage. You need to say the building owner to create policies, need statement and a design stage to address the strategy of zero energy. And during construction stage, uh, to, to build the building according to the specification, what they call outline during the design, and even uh, later stage the, at the commissioning stage. It is uh, beyond the conventional testing and commissioning. And build, when the building occupied and monitor, they verified the, the consumption stage and provide the reporting. If all the six core completed, meaning to say the building had undergo systematic, what I call uh, make the building uh, zero energy. <clears throat> when come to definitions, zero energy building, a lot of countries have different kind of definitions. In Europe, uh, they have several definitions, but uh, we like these uh, definitions introduced by the Japanese, which is also currently have been proposed to ISO to adopt as a standardized of methodology is the building, if what they call design or operate energy efficient, so lowering the energy up to 50%, meaning to say that building already achieved zero, ready to go zero. Meaning the Japanese, they said ZEP ready, but in fact, uh, in Malaysia, we mentioned it ready to go zero. Just doing energy efficiency without renewable energy. That is the first requirement. If they're not reduce the energy by energy efficiency to 50%, the building should not be considered as towards zero energy. And then after that, with the advances of uh, with the advances of energy efficiency and deployment of renewable energy, the net energy reduced further up to 75%. So it reached or become nearly zero. And with the advances of renewable energy and energy efficiency, it offset 100% the use of energy in the building, meaning to say it achieved net zero. That is the methodology that currently in Malaysia, Saddam Malaysia, uh, what they call adopted for our own uh, zero energy program. So when it come to uh, mapping, people always confuse between green building and energy efficient building, and also the zero energy building. The right, the left side here, actually is the conventional green building. So energy efficient building on the other side. I mean, some pe people, I mean, some building, they just want to do energy. They have they have only limited budget. They just want to do energy. They have limited budget to do uh, water, waste, and so on. But they focus on energy. So meaning to say, the right angle here, uh, the right side here is for those wanted to start to go what they call green with the basic green started with energy efficiency. So step by step, and so 
after a certain level, they can choose whether they want to proceed with green building or not. But uh, at the same time also, it offer options to a building owner. You also can go for zero energy. You enhance the sustainable energy in the building by having RE into the building and achieve uh, what I call zero energy. So meaning to say, there's an option. You want to go green building or you want to go zero energy. But it start with energy efficiency. In Malaysia, uh, there's uh, nine rating tools, and we scan the what I call the, the, the tools back in 2018. We, and we found that uh, the, the tools number six, Green Pass, is the construction industry standard by uh, Construction Industry Develop Development Board, uh, have a suitable to measures just for those doing sustainable energy, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And so, in Malaysia, we adopt, we meet uh, CIDB. And we said we want to adopt a green pass operation for our assessment for low carbon building and zero energy building. So uh, what inside the CS20 or green pass by CDB and SEDA Malaysia is the tools is not assess how you do it. It assess what you achieve. So in terms of uh, uh, assessment, it's only assess the percentage of energy and carbon reductions. Okay? So, when the Japanese, uh, Japanese expert come to Malaysia, they introduced the zero energy building concept. They're also using ratio of a reduction as the as a, what they call assessment degree of uh, zero energy uh, that's going to be achieved. So when we choose the what they call the concept from uh, Zap Japan and the Green Pass, actually it matching. We so we no need to reinvent uh, assessment tool. We use whatever assessment tool already have, and then we adopt another what they call a concept to attach it zero energy. Meaning to say, uh, just now I said, if the building achieve 50% uh, energy efficiency and it's already entered, ZEP ready. And after that, improve gradually until it achieves net zero. When it comes to ecosystem, <clears throat> it's already available in Malaysia. The only need to do is to coordinate all these what I call uh, uh, support to support the zero energy building. For example, the tools is already there. The low carbon cities program is already there. The standard is already there. The guideline reference, you can use the current existing guideline reference for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Product also is there, energy efficient product ready. Appliances uh, by what they call energy commissions uh, and so on. Training capacity buildings, there's numbers of training providers uh, doing this including for those conduct training for green building, basically the same, I mean, the same concept, what need to do is only enhance the part of sustainable energy. R&D by local universities also have there, online monitoring in terms of uh, professionals. We don't need to have another category professional of uh, green pass and so on. Just utilize the professional that been trained by either by Green, green RE, by GBI, by MyCrise, by uh, Leeds, and so on, or even by Green Mark. And so the same professional can, can provide the services. Incentive on energy efficiency, renewable energy also available, even financial for energy performance contracting. Net energy metering program for installing solar photovoltaics is available. Facilitation on zero energy, Seda Malaysia provided. it. And also we have a contractor, meaning to say, if you want to retrofit your building without cost, there's a ESCO or company outside there, even solar company there. There is a program they call it EPC, Energy Performance Contracting. This contractor can make your building energy efficient or super energy efficient. And there's also another contractor can install solar without cost on your roof, but certain agreement for a long-term agreement. And combination of these two energy efficiency and renewable energy can make the zero energy. Uh, and come about cost, that is these, uh, uh, what they call uh, issues that people always mention, the cost is expensive. But we have done what they call research studies from various uh, program, uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Cost to reduce one kilowatt hour uh, energy is about 60 cents to four, four ringgit per kilowatt hour. And renewable energy is about six ringgit to a ringgit per kilowatt hour. So depend on the portion. If you divide 50-50, then you know what is the estimated cost. But if say energy efficiency contributes 70%, renewable energy 30%, then you can uh, estimate what is the cost to make net zero or what degree of zero you want. 
Zero energy building is not new in Malaysia. It's already started back in 2007, starting uh, 2004, starting with the uh, Ministry of Energy Building, Law Energy Office. But that time we didn't call it zero energy. We call it the uh, Leo Building, Law Energy Office. But because of the performance of the building by design, safe energy more than 50%. If you refer back to the, the methodology definition just now, actually it's already go for, it's already achieved uh, ZEP ready. And the Green Tech Malaysia building also, the net energy achieved about uh, 20, uh, 85%. Energy efficiency contribute about 67%. So it's already near zero. And it's a last energy, ASEAN Energy Award, the Green Tech building, the Geo building, achieve an uh, uh, achievement of uh, zero, zero energy building award by uh, ASEAN Energy Award. Even the Energy Commission building also achieve what they call uh, the zero energy. And how about industry? Uh, this is example uh, in 2011, Panasonic Green Warehouse in Shah Alam. It's failed green building uh, uh, certification. But because of their energy efficiency achieved more than 70%, Without renewable energy, it eh, already achieved more than 75. If not mistaken, the time when we do assessments, it achieved reduction about 85%. So it's already uh, near zero based on the performance. And people talking about commercial industry, how about residential? In fact, residential in Malaysia, terrace house, for example, easily can achieve uh, zero energy, depending on what degree of zero you want to achieve. It can be achieved there. This is example, common residential house, but the owner implement energy efficiency. And then after a few years, it is uh, installed what I call uh, uh, solar photovoltaic. By doing energy efficiency, achieve 61%. So by definition, it's already achieved uh, new ZEP ready. And with the renewable energy, it's achieved 100%. And in terms of certification, voluntary. When I mentioned here, voluntary, because there's no law related to even green building and uh, zero energy in Malaysia. So all is voluntary. So two institutions uh, have been awarded uh, zero energy building, like for example, one university in Laka back in 2018. It achieved uh, what they call uh, ZEP ready because uh, by doing energy efficiency, it reduced 50, more than 50%. And also the one of the local authorities in Petaling Jaya, they have done retro, uh, energy audit retrofitting, uh, major retrofitting, and managed to reduce energy uh, more than 50%. People will say, oh, because of the pandemic, uh, of course, nobody used. But these certifications, I mean, this data is before the pandemic, meaning to say they have done the energy efficiency reduction before the pandemic, more than 50%. Right? When come to new building, uh, this is our new uh, facilitations to uh, one universities. They are in the progress of development, this uh, development of positive zero energy building, which consists of office and lab. It, this uh, building is also our training partner eh, because uh, they conduct renewable energy, solar photovoltaic, grid connected, and off grid uh, training uh, using SEDA's syllabus. And uh, at the same time, they make the building super energy efficient and with renewable energy. Uh, the consultant uh, at uh, what I call estimate. The building will achieve net zero, positive uh, uh, zero energy when the building completed. It's in the process of certification for new building, uh, six diamond. I think that's all uh, the brief on uh, development of uh, zero energy building in Malaysia. And I pass back to the uh, secretariat. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it was certainly a very thorough presentation of roadmaps in Malaysia. And um, I'll save your questions for the end of the uh, end of the episode. But thank you again. The next speaker on our lineup is Ayar Tan Zuhan. Ayar Tan is an award-winning development professional, architect, and thought leader in sustainable architecture. He is the chairman of Sustainability, 
for Singapore's Institute of Architects and is currently working on sustainable development for a leading hospital chain. Han is also appointed World City Summit Young Leader. Um, he was Singapore's 2015-2016 BCA SGBC Young Green Architect of Year, sorry, Young Green Architect of the Year. His portfolio includes award-winning Park Royal on Pickering with Woha and the BCA Skylab. A rotatable test bed for new technologies, which won a Minister's Award on Singapore's National Day back in 2017. He has spoken in numerous conferences, including Switch, the Asia Pacific Urban Forum, and COP25 in Madrid. I would like to welcome uh, Ead Tan I, and uh, hand over to you. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen, yeah? Uh, thank you so much, um, Juanita, for the, um, for the uh, invitation. Let's see, let's see now. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. Uh, Juanita, you give me too much credit. I'm actually working in hospitality, not in a hospital uh, chain. <laughs> Although that would, that would have been yeah, uh, nice in this time and in this time and age, yeah. and making a difference. Hopefully. All right, you should be able to see my screen. Yeah. All right. So with uh, 20 minutes, I'm gonna try to give this a slightly different direction uh, than my very uh, illustrious first two speakers. Uh, Yvonne is actually uh, an industry colleague uh, at the Green Building Council, so it's um, very nice to have heard from her. And uh, thank you also to Stephen for sharing uh, on the Malaysian uh, end of things. And um, before I begin, good afternoon. Selamat sejahtera to all the friends in Malaysia, as well as um, audiences from all over. Today I'll be sharing a bit on the uh, seven environmental design guidelines that were formulated by the Institute of Architects. Uh, so I am a trained uh, architect, uh, although my work right now is more in uh, sustainable development. Uh, they aren't two different things, they're actually one and the same. Let me, um, uh, Juanita, if it's okay to, to drag your mouse away, there's two pointers on, um, on screen. Or is that uh, on my own screen? Well, never mind. So these are the uh, environmental design guidelines. These are the sustainable development goals. This is something that's called the uh, Green Plan. Uh, 2030. So there is a plan towards achieving a certain uh, level of greenness, I would say, in Singapore by 2030. A bit more on that later on. And these are the icons for Green Mark 2021, the uh, latest in uh, sort of a evolving version of, of Green Mark uh, since 15 or 16 years ago. And um, it continually gets refined. And uh, the whole idea of this is how do we deal with all these different icons? How do we find the overlaps and so on? And in the context of this talk, sort of try to approach net zero, right? Whatever that might mean in our different communities and our different cities. So the green plan basically looks at um, city and nature. And right? so the terms have changed a little bit. So Singapore used to be the garden city, of course, and then they changed it basically to city and nature, which um, I think empowers uh, the whole concept of nature quite a bit in that we are still subservient and secondary to nature, even as a species. Sustainable living, energy reset, which is where you'll find most of the uh, green mark as well as the uh, super low energy, zero energy requirements, uh, super low energy thesis. The green economy, right, how these can actually start to uh, create new opportunities uh, for new economics in Singapore. And of course, green government, uh, how that all comes and ties uh, the whole plan together through incentives, through policies, through guidelines, and so on. All right, so the next um, 15 and 20 minutes, I'll be looking at how that impacts the built environment. So of course, the idea is um, how does the SIA wheel on the left, meaning the, uh, the environmental design goals, right, how do we turn that to green economics and ultimately create a little wheel of fortune, right? Not that the goal is uh, to you know, make a lot of money out of this, uh, not at all. The goal really is how do we ensure that the economics of the situation presents itself in a way that is still equitable, such that low energy, net zero energy, and so on, does not become a detractor to building projects. So 
pulling you know back a little bit and then understanding what on earth is happening or what's happening on earth um, over the past three years we've seen a tremendous change i think uh, in terms of um, how we deal with uh, environmental issues as well so uh, 2019 we've had this whole uh, i suppose this whole woke uh, awakening of um, the waste problem we started looking at um, of course, unfortunately, forest fires in the Amazon and Australia and so on as well. And then we ended 2019 with COP25. I had the opportunity to attend that in Madrid. And um, I think while the discussions were robust, the actual actions were limited because we realized that so much of influence on the global climate issues is really determined by the global superpowers. And uh, 2020 hit, of course, uh, so did COVID uh, towards uh, the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020. Right. And 2020 also saw the change in government in the United States, which also meant that commitments towards uh, climate change policies also saw a change, hopefully for the better. And hopefully in 2021, we're seeing a bit of a, a economic recovery, you know, of course, with uh, the vaccines coming into play. And through all that, part of the role of the Institute of Architects is to determine what are the, the uh, levers which we, we can push, what are the... Um, the pegs, right, in which we can use to be able to determine how architecture as a profession or how the built environment as a profession uh, can therefore thrive and continue with sustainability at its heart. So looking at these 17 uh, sustainable development goals, the goal isn't really to solve all 17 of them as architects, right? Um, we do try to save the world, but um, sometimes it's not so easy, but we do look at certain specific areas out of these 17 where we can actually create a difference uh, through the built environment. And therefore, the seven environmental design goals have come about. And these goals really are the encapsulation of several or more of the uh, sustainable development goals by the United Nations. So the first of which is education and integration, allowing the built environment to become a leader in um, this whole uh, idea of, of uh, the pursuit towards net zero as well, something Stephen alluded to in a talk just before this even though it is a very elusive goal, uh, as Yvonne has shared with us, especially in the context of uh, land scarce in Singapore. In any case, there are different metrics and measurables in how this uh, sort of integrated environment for a built environment and this whole integrated sort of uh, efforts as well when it comes to energy uh, can then come in. And these could be through uh, various tools um, in, in engagement. So an example of such a project would, in this case, be uh, the BCA Skylab, a project that was earlier mentioned. So Skylab is a project that I had a chance to work with the Singapore Building and Construction Authority with. Uh, effectively, it's a rotatable um, lab. It's uh, probably the smallest project I've ever done, but probably also one of the most significant. And because it's so small, right, it's, um, you, you, can, you can actually sort of divide the lab into a control area as well as an experimental area, and you can install new building technologies. They can be facades, air conditioning systems, and all these have sensors in order to track the building performance. So the granularity of um, the new building system therefore becomes uh, very much more resolved. And in doing so, we are therefore allowed a chance to determine how well the building product performs before it gets rolled out into the industry. Likewise with the uh, SIA Green Book. So the Green Book basically is um, something that, uh, that, that encapsulates, first of all, the uh, seven environmental design goals and presents examples of projects, but also guides the process uh, in architecture, where throughout the process, you can have different green practices and that will enrich uh, the nature of the project. But um, hopefully at some point, it also becomes a more sort of uh, established guide, such as sustainable practice becomes part and parcel of the entire process. Climate action, basically determining through um, low operational carbon, looking at low pollution indices, and looking at that as a mode of uh, planning for projects. So in this case, a uh, master plan in Thailand, determining of course limits in, um, in uh, basically pollution, but also controls in terms of energy efficiency and water efficiency, and down to the more meso or micro level, determining that buildings do need to present a sort of a renewable aspect where they can renew their energy consumption. Natural capital, again, looking at um, architecture as a mode of engaging with nature. We are 
part of the whole biodiversity, right? We cannot be seen as being removed from the biodiversity as human beings. We are part of nature. So how do we look at um, integration with nature, even with our, big, uh, with our brick, mortar, and steel uh, uh, construction, right? So one way is, of course, in terms of landscape replacement. So you see, in this case, a project that um, replaces the green amount of land that it's um, basically set on, of course, through different modes, right? They could be vertical greens and um, also greens that you experience in the interiors of the building. Resource management, looking at minimizing, I think, not just embodied carbon, which also goes a long way towards a net zero kind of environment, but also looking at um, recycling and upcycling materials uh, for construction. So looking at, um, in terms of energy percentage of replacement and energy, energy utilization index, which we also use as a mode of achieving our green mark ratings, right? And water efficiency and water replacement as well. Uh, in terms of materials, of course, ensuring that um, their end of life is uh, properly dealt with, right? And ensuring that their whole life carbon is also addressed. And in this case, um, with MiniWiz, a project which makes use of 1.5 million recycled water bottles. So these have been fashioned into bricks that you can find uh, on the facades and on some of the interiors as well. Number five now, urban harmony, ensuring that um, the building becomes a conduit of connection uh, for environmental experiences and um, an extension of nature almost. So even though it's a highly dense environment in this case, we do create opportunities of community engagement, right, uh, of um, community bonding and so on as well, right, while ensuring that the building is able to breathe. And speaking of which, health and well-being ultimately extremely important, especially in the times of this pandemic. And for example, this uh, EDG here would encapsulate four of the SDGs of the Sustainable Development Goals in clean water and sanitation, renewable energy, reduce inequalities, and sustainable cities and communities. So using these metrics and measurables, again, to determine if the building is indeed healthy, right? So the wellness or the well-being of the occupant is, is crucial in the case of a resort, of a, in this case, Park Royal Hotel again, where if you're a hotel resident, you'll be looking out into gardens and these visual greens would actually help and your sense of relaxation and taking it one step further, having every ward within a hospital building design in India look out into visual green and having them access a garden. So even though this block here is for end of life and terminally ill patients, we're still giving them that dignity um, as human beings and have them enjoy say spa treatments and access to wellness and green. And finally, adaptability and longevity. How does this uh, sort of impact, you know, the, the whole move towards net zero and the most sustainable building to some is the building that you never have to build. So in this case, how do you adapt an existing structure and existing building into something that has a brand new use? So design for maintainability, DFM is a new concept, um, not a new concept, sorry, a new uh, element as well in the green mark rating, green mark 2021. And as basically sort of um, agents of the built environment, what we tend to do would be to uh, try to preserve longevity as much as we can. And a case in, in, in point would be a project with uh, Woha Architects about um, almost 10 years ago now, where we took, uh, instead of um, sort of replacing three conservation buildings, we um, replaced the unit in the middle with a new structure and conserved the other two such that you have a seamless experience in this case of uh, global furniture chain. Right, so um, using the seven SDGs and allowing that to sort of extend across the entire project timeline. So back to the SIA Green Book, as we've shown a few slides ago, uh, that basically presents a different, uh, different stages in which these can also be applied. An example of a project like that as a study would be a new modular green building where we looked at the day one or the multi-purpose hall typology uh, back in, you know, in Southeast Asia and even in South Asia, where uh, a whole naturally, naturally ventilated environment would allow for a certain porosity and a flexibility within the uh, project plan or within the um, program as well, right? So if we could have a one-size-fits-all building, what would it look like, right? So this would be that building where the building becomes adaptable. You could have um, hospital wards uh, in times of need. Uh, for example, the pandemic, the building would be self-sufficient. You could have research labs within right, with um, live test cases maybe, right? And um, it could also become the center for deploying uh, emergency healthcare, both into the building itself and also out of the building to other satellite such facilities. Yeah. And this would hopefully embody um, the seven environmental design goals that was just spoken of. So sustainable buildings do have a significant agency in the fight against um, COVID-19 or touch wood. 
a future global pandemic. And so much of the response towards this pandemic has been in terms of frontline, right? But uh, increasingly we're becoming aware of more and more of the variants and how they can be spread uh, through the air as well, right? With this as a backdrop, the uh, Singapore Green Plan was released. And the Green Plan is a series of broad goals, um, which each have their own definition. I won't go through each one of them, but effectively it's a plan where out of um, the different economies right, uh, that, that do exist within Singapore, there are ways of actually pushing uh, the sustainability quotient. And in summary, we've got, first of all, city in nature, right, which is the creation of green, livable, and sustainable homes uh, for Singaporeans. Green Mark goes a long way towards achieving that because Green Mark for residential buildings will indeed become one of the metrics of um, how we treat city and nature. Uh, sustainable living, saving resources and reducing carbon footprint. That again is embodied in the uh, whole life carbon aspect in uh, the Green Mark Code, but also in the way that we treat consumption, also in the way that we treat, um, you know, I'd say hyper consumption, uh, fast fashion, fast food, and these kinds of things, right? How do we uh, sort of draw a balance uh, with our consumption habits as well? Uh, energy reset using cleaner energy and increased energy efficiency. I love that image that was shown in the previous uh, uh, talk by Stephen, where he had a pail that was leaking, right? And in, indeed, energy reset, a lot of it has to do with minimizing wastage, right? Before we look at renewables as well, or, or it could be simultaneous. And green economy, harnessing sustainability as a new engine of jobs and growth. Ultimately, that is, of course, very crucial in, um, in Singapore. Um, we are unfortunately not um, very sort of abundant in terms of natural resource. Right? So a lot of the economies that we get into has to be in a tertiary industry. And finally, green government with um, the public sector uh, leading the efforts on sustainability. And through all this, that leads towards a resilient future, hopefully, right? and also self-sustaining self uh, economy. And I say this with a bit of tongue in cheek because so much of our economy and so much of our sustenance also depends on Malaysia. Right? So can we therefore look at um, a green plan as a more holistic and maybe even eventually a regional um, mutually beneficial sort of plan? And Greenmark, um, I think Yvonne touched a bit on this earlier, right? the goals that were set in terms of um, what we need to hit by 2030 in terms of green buildings. So energy efficiency, health and well-being, resilience, whole life carbon, maintainability, and building intelligence, right? What does this, how does a smart building uh, come about? How does it work? So you've seen some of these icons in the uh, first session earlier. And I think the challenge that we have as building professionals is that how do we deal with so many different icons, right? That's so, so many different matrices and criteria out there. So what we've done is to try to map the environmental design goals that are inherent in the practice of architecture in that green book with the, um, the goals that's been set out in the green plan and find where these commonalities or where these points of intersection would be. And these points of intersection are crucial because you know, we wanna find those stones that can kill multiple birds at one go, proverbially speaking. We're not about to kill any um, natural life forms. But in this case, also tying that back into green marks. So if you look at the different statutory requirements where we need to pass these, if we don't pass it, we cannot build our building. We don't get our building plan um, a, a permits to, to move ahead, right? But how do we find these common points between three related but different sets of ratings right, or different sets of guidelines. The Green Plan, the Environmental Design Goals, and Green Mark 2021. So you see in some aspects, for example, City in Nature, you'll find more of these icons happening, right? And resource management obviously plays a big role, right? So too, there's climate action and adaptability and longevity. So these are ways where we can start prioritizing and looking at um, uh, joint efforts, I would say amongst different stakeholders. And the idea of creating impact therefore is um, in secondary school physics, uh, you'll be looking at um, the amplification of waves, right? Or if you're a sound mixer or a DJ, this might too be relevant. So with the green plan, the uh, green mark 2021 and the EDGs, finding the right confluences, finding the right amplitudes and having them play in phase. And when they're in phase, basically you get a greater wave that could be three times a 3x on the amount of amplitude. So part of that really also looks at how we zone our lands, right? how we treat our buildings as, uh, as a result of the uh, land zoning. Right? So typically you have either a greenfield, which is a brand new plot of land, or brownfield, something's been built on it before and you're adapting 
right? Just like EDG number seven. And the reality is that we could find a bit of an olive field, which is of course a different shade of green or a different shade of brown, depending on how you look at it. So you no longer just look at green as green or brown as brown. There are different shades within, right? And these different shades could lead to different types of um, green productivity as well. So for instance, you could have something like this. This isn't in Singapore, it's in Thailand. It's um, the Thammasat University campus where green and even planting of food and agriculture actually happens within the learning environment. And I haven't talked so much about blue, the blue plants of a city, but blue also shows up in this as well. So imagine a building for learning that has a green cover and right, it's part of its green plot ratio, but also a productive green plot ratio at that because just like the terraces of any fields for plantations uh, in, you know, in Southeast Asia, you would have these terraces as well in a very uh, urban uh, sort of environment. And also the, the sort of boundaries between what is green versus what is a hard pavement and hard concrete that starts to change uh, depending on how we look at different structures. So looking at some um, ways of this that also comes back and contributes towards the entire net zero conversation. And in closing, again, looking at these uh, variables, right? All these are different icons, different levers, different modes of action that we can actually perform, right? These might be guidelines, but ultimately guidelines will turn into actionables and finding the right confluences because it is precisely these confluences that will allow us to leverage on multiple aspects of sustainability, not just in building, but also in landscape planning, also in zonal planning, right, when it comes to um, urban design, and um, basically also looking how we as consumers ultimately consume and also contribute to the whole energy equation. And that, I think, would become a more significant conversation towards a net zero built environment, right, looking beyond buildings. So with that, um, thank you very much. Um, look forward to the uh, questions later. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Juanita. Thank you, uh, Erhan. It was certainly uh, very exciting to see the possibilities of integrating our buildings with nature and also the very important fact that we do need to re-envision our buildings to, to consider life that's not going to be normal anymore after COVID, post-COVID, or to, um, to anticipate potentially future pandemic that we would have to, to live through. And uh, our buildings will need to accommodate all these needs in, in one specific building. Okay, I have a number of questions, but I'll save it for the end. And I would like to move on to our next speaker. Mr. Darren Bentley, he will from Environmental Design Solutions, who will be covering a case study on Honeywell School Net Zero Design Performance in the UK. EDSL develops software design tools for architects and engineers to stimulate the environmental performance and occupant well-being in buildings. They are primary authors of their software. Uh, Mr. Darren has worked with EDSL for the last 20 years, primarily in technical support and training role. I would like to pass the, pass the slide on to you, Mr. Darren. Thank you. Can everyone, can everyone see this, that? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Darren Bentley, and as I say, I work for EDSL, the producers of TAS software. Uh, I'm going to be covering uh, using energy modeling to achieve net zero buildings. I'm going to talk about a number of topics there. Uh, firstly, what energy modeling is and the process of creating a model. Uh, also talking about passive designs, ways of reducing energy, see the results in tests and that. Uh, modeling things like lighting control, and finally modeling renewables such as PV panels. Uh, uh, so the uses of energy modeling. Uh, you draw the geometry in, and with that, you've got the thermal mass and the orientation of the building. Uh, you've also got uh, solar information, uh, we, where you have weather data, and we look at the hourly position of the sun, uh, and we can see whether the building is being shaded by other buildings or self-shading, including feature shading. Uh, we also can do daylighting calculations. Uh, 
model the envelope facade, that's the type of glass, the thermal mass of the construction. Uh, not so useful here in Malaysia and Singapore, but we also model lateral ventilation. Thermal comfort, to see if the space overheats. And more importantly here, designing HVAC systems and simulating them to see how uh, much energy they produce and see what energy efficiencies we can gain from them. Uh, so energy packages also calculate heat loads, uh, which can then be used to size the HVAC uh, and also design the HVAC system through schematics. And you can uh, model individual uh, components within these packages. Uh, so going into what energy modeling takes into account, it's a dynamic simulation package uh, that models up to a year's worth of uh, data. Uh, firstly, we take into account the climate and we have access to multiple databases from around the world. It's hourly weather data, it includes things like the solar gain, uh, the temperature of the space, uh, sorry, temperature outside, the wind speed and the wind direction. We also have uh, the construction properties, uh, the U values of the gl glazing and the walls and floors and ceilings and the G values of the glazing. As I mentioned before, we also model the shading, uh, the airflow within the space, even if your model is not naturally ventilated, doesn't have windows over to the outside, air still flows within the spaces and packages like ours can model that. Uh, we also take into account the internal conditions, the occupants, uh, what temperatures people are controlling the temperature to, uh, the equipment, the lighting things. And finally, you have to take into account the HVAC system, the uh, efficiencies thereof. Uh, once you've put all that information out, the kind of data you can get out of packages, uh, energy modeling packages include annual insulation, uh, hourly temperatures, both dry bulb and operative. Uh, but most importantly for what we're looking at today, annual energy consumptions, costs and CO2 emissions. This graph, for example, is showing uh, the hourly energy use split up into heating, cooling, auxiliary and lighting. That green line, which is below the zero, is the amount of electricity generated by the PV panels in this case. So, uh, this data can be output either visually, graphically, uh, or as tables. Now I'm gonna look at a particular building. It's actually not Hollywell, it's Buntingford. And this building is located 50 kilometers north of central London. Uh, its total floor area is 1,640 meters squared. Uh, and we're gonna take it through an energy performance certificate. This is how the UK uh, aims to get net zero buildings. Uh, it is a rating scheme to summarize the energy efficiency of buildings, uh, measuring the CO2 emissions. Uh, and that's what the value called the building emissions rating is. It's the heating, cooling, lighting, auxiliary gains, minus any uh, CO2 emissions taken away from by PV panels and the like, uh, gives you your uh, building emissions rating. And what we do is compare the actual building to a notional building. The notional building is one that is the same size and shape as your actual building, but exactly meets the uh, UK standards. And this gives us a scale from A to G, effectively. Uh, G uh, is a particularly poor building, one with high CO2 emissions. B would be on target, that's what you're aiming for. A would be a good building with low CO2 emissions. And A plus, which is what we're looking for, aiming for here, is better uh, than zero. It's, it must use renewables, as it says there. So the first stage is to enter the geometry. Uh, you can either do that within the packages themselves, or you can do it by importing the geometry from somewhere else. If you do it natively, we do it through a set of floor plans. You can create thousands of spaces and create your own windows, doors, and shades. Uh, the other option is to import via something like GBXML. So you draw it in another package such as Revit, import it into the energy modeling package, 
uh, and these programs heal and forgive uh, any errors that are found within the geometry. Uh, and you can then, if the model gets changed, import the model again. So a couple of methods there. The second stage is feature shading. You can again actually draw the shades, and I'm talking about things like overhangs and warnings within TAS, or you can import them. Uh, if you import them, uh, you have to do that because even if you had the 3D model in GBXML, uh, shading features don't get transferred. So you've got to uh, take them from somewhere else. When programs model shading, they do both direct and diffuse. So from both the sun and the sky. And you're able to model multiple instances of the shade at once. These shades have an impact on solar gain and daylight availability. So it's a bit about the balance here between you want daylight to reduce the amount of energy used by lighting, but you obviously don't want the solar gain heating up the space. You can alternately import the shading from a 3D DWG file. And again, you can merge with shading that's already within the model and edit it within our program. So after you've entered the geometry and entered the shading, the next important stage is to enter information about the constructions. So uh, for opaque constructions, we model the thermal mass and the reflectance, both the solar and the uh, emissivity. For glazing, uh, packages model the uh, solar reflectance and transmission and absorptance, the uh, lighting transmittance reflectance and the U value, the thermal properties of the glazing as well. We model each layer of the construction individually. So it's a bit more sophisticated than just a G value or U value uh, that, that's often used. We actually model the way the solar, uh, the emissivity bounces between surfaces and the solar gain uh, bounces as well. But we do display the U values and G values for those constructions so you can compare them with others. Uh, users can create and save their own constructions. So let's look at Buntingford, uh, this particular building that we're going to model. I'm, we started with six millimeters of K-glass, a 12 millimeter air gap and six millimeters of water float. Uh, this gave us a G value of 0.683 and a U value according to EN 673 standards of 1.94. It's not the best glass, but that was the point to start then. Uh, the next stage is then, once we've got the constructions, is to look at the daylight. If we know the daylight, we can control our lighting based on the daylight within the space. Uh, packages have built-in daylight modeling energies, and we use a radiosity-based method. Uh, it models the scattered light better. Uh, we also, daylighting calculations can be very uh, resource intensive. So uh, we model them over multiple PC cores to get around that issue. Uh, and the results can be viewed within a TV plan. Uh, and also rendered images can be generated. Most importantly for what we're interested in here, however, is they can be linked to lighting controls. Once we have daylight information, we can have the lights uh, come on and off during the day. Those lighting controls then, uh, we calculate the daylight factor for each of the spaces uh, using hourly climate data. We know the daylight factor and the amount of natural light outside. We know the amount of natural light inside each space on each hour. The user then enter the lighting efficiency and any control information, and that will produce uh, the lighting gain. In our particular model, uh, we had automatic presence detection. So, the lights were turned on during the day and they were automatically switched off uh, when people left the space. But there was initially no daylight control. And the general power density of the lighting was nearly four watts per meter squared. The next stage is to model the HVAC system that is used by the buildings. Uh, it uses the results from the dynamic simulation that we would have already done, which gives us the, the loads and the temperatures within the space. 
Uh, and then the user can enter detailed information about the plant room and about the air side. Uh, it outputs consumption, demand, CO2 emissions and costs. You can enter in your own CO2 emission ratings in your own costings to get up those values. And it outputs those results annually, daily, monthly and hourly. We also have a wizard that has typical systems. So that's a good place to start off. You pick a system that's closest to what you have and then you can edit afterwards. Uh, each airside system and each plant has its own schematic, which is editable. Uh, and components can be added and removed. Uh, for example, uh, we might want to add an additional uh, fan or something like that. We also model complex control logic. Uh, so we can have the fans come on and off under certain conditions, uh, air flowing when it's cooler, etc. And that helps us model it to reflect real life design and take into account energy efficiency measures. Uh, we can even go further and uh, create complex controls using Lua code as well. In our particular case, we had, uh, sorry, not in our particular case, this is a, an example of a system. Uh, this is a chilled beam and an air handling unit using the same chiller. The water supply temperature to the HU is lower than that for the chilled beam. Uh, all latent cooling is performed by the HU to avoid condensation on the chilled beam. And the pumps and valves were controlled to maintain the temperature whenever cooling was required. And you can see by each of the target values uh, that are on the screen, that we can see on an hour what the temperature is at any given point within the system. Um, in our particular example, the uh, Buntingford School, we did have an active chilled beam the seasonal efficiency was 3.6 for the heating and for the cooling. So let's go through what we have with our building so far. It had an active chill beam with heating and cooling efficiency, seasonal efficiency 3.6. It has U values which were better than the regular treated standard and a glass with a G value of 0.683 and lighting with automatic presence section but no daylight control and no renewables at this stage. And let's have a look at the results for this. So the building emissions rating value here is 16.86 kilograms per 16.86 kilograms per CO2 per meter squared. Uh, and its EPC rating is 37. That's, that meets uh, the UK regulatory standard, but uh, can be improved upon. It's a rating B. So that's our starting building. Well, let's enter some improved glass. This time I'm going to use six millimeters of clear glass, 12 millimeters of argon, and a six millimeter of low E. The G value is lower this time at 0.525, and the U value is lower as well at nearly one. And these are the results side by side. So on the left hand side, we have the base case with the G value of 0.683, and on the right side, we have the building with a G value of 0.525. So all we've changed at this point is the glass. And we can see that the heating is reduced, the annual energy consumption, as has the lighting, uh, the fans, uh, but the lighting is unaffected because we're not doing any kind of daylight control and the whole water surface is unaffected. So the heating reduced because uh, we had better U values, so less energy was being lost that way. And because we had a better G value, less daylight, Less light, less solar gain was getting in, and so it wasn't cooling the space so much. The next thing we did to improve the building was add a uh, awning. Uh, the awning was 2.5 meters in length, went so in width, and went the whole length of the uh, building. The each slat was spaced 0.3 meters apart. Uh, the angle from the horizontal was 135 degrees, and the depth of each slat was 0.2 meters. So on the left hand side, we're still looking at the base case, the original one. On the second hand, we're looking at both the feature shading and the solar gain at the same time. And again, we're seeing a bit of reduction in heating, but that's mainly from the uh, glazing, uh, but a further reduction in the cooling. So we're 
our building emissions rating was 16.86. We've reduced it down further to 16.2. Remember, we're aiming for as close to zero as possible here. One of the most important things we can do to improve our energy efficiency is daylight control. So once again, we're going to have automatic presence detection. But this time, we're going to have daylight control, photo cell control dimming. So as it's brighter in the room, the lights will turn off. Uh, same general power density. Right? To make it more of a light to light check. And now we're getting even more reduction. Uh, that reduction is in both the lighting and the cooling, uh, as you'd expect, as the, the lighting heats up the space and we require cooling to prevent that. So we've gone from a value of 16.86 down to 15.3. Uh, so what were the ways we could reduce energy use? Uh, passive design. So we're talking uh, better glazing, shading, and things like that. Efficient lighting and controls. And of course, an efficient plant. We didn't play with a plant in this particular case, but that would have been another way of doing it. And more sophisticated HVAC systems as well. Uh, but none of that will get us to zero time. For that, we need renewables. So stage six is modeling renewables. Uh, packages such as us can model solar hot water panels, wind turbines, PV panels. Uh, the panels themselves can be drawn either in a 3D model or added in at the HVAC stage. Uh, if you model them in the HVAC, you can have them track the sun for optimum performance. Let me move. Panels and turbines use the hourly weather data. So for the turbines, we're interested in the wind speed and wind direction for the panels, uh, the solar gain. And we can also model more sophisticated systems like iron storage chillers and vertical boreholes. So we tried a number of renewables. We started with solar hot water panels with an efficiency of 76% and a surface area of 40 meters squared. Again, we're trying to aim now for zero or better in that BER and the building emissions rating and with solar hot water, we can't do it. It reduces the hot water services, but uh, the other values remain the same. So we tried adding wind turbines with a peak efficiency of 20%, swept area of 10 meters squared and a half height of 10 meters squared, 10 meters naturally. Uh, the number of turbines to get to a zero had to be 50. So the results were, we did get a negative value of building emissions, we managed it. We needed 15 wind turbines to do it. And that gave us the EPC rating of A+. Uh, the amount of electricity generated by those turbines had to be 31 kilowatt, kilowatt, hour, kilowatt hours per meter squared over the year uh, to offset the energy used by the building. So we tried panels instead. Uh, this time uh, their efficiency was set as 20%, surface area 270 meters squared, and the results were similar to the wind turbine, because that's what we were aiming for. And we got a, a, an A plus rating again, that's what we're aiming for. So we either needed 50 wind turbines, the given efficiency, or 270 meters squared of PV panels. Uh, the amount of electricity generated by the PV panels was obviously similar to that of the wind turbines, because that was the aim. So our final check uh, was, to try with the improved design, which is what we did there, we went through all the changes in the passive design, the lighting control, the shading, and then we added the PV panel. That's what's on the left. And on the right, uh, we took the base case, which did not have the lighting, the construct, uh, the better glazing, etc., and put the PV panels there. And we can see to effectively get the building emissions rating that we want, net zero, uh, CO2 emissions, we needed an extra 50 meters squared of panels. And that sort of shows what we can do with PV panels, uh, sorry, with uh, passive design. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, TAS is now operating in uh, Singapore uh, in association with ESDSB, uh, Roy Sim. And so if you have any further questions on carbon passive design solutions, uh, please uh, contact him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. 
it was um, certainly interesting to see how much uh, room there is to play around with passive design and alternatives to uh, renewable energy. Okay, um, I have a number of questions for our panelists. Can I start with uh, Yvonne? Uh, one of the questions that came in was, um, you mentioned a lot on uh, RE and um, operational carbon, but uh, are you also looking at embodied carbon? Uh, so we are, in fact, um, you know, the Singapore Green Building Council, we certify building products, whilst BCA looks at the buildings, right? So embodied carbon comes from the materials in construction. So that would definitely be something that we would uh, be focusing on. We will be launching an initiative for our industry sometime in July with the... Well, we're, we're planning to do it with the Real Estate Developers uh, Association of Singapore. So uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, under wraps now till we launch it. Yep. But um, yes, definitely um, looking at embodied carbon and um, shaping the kind of materials uh, that our industry will be using. So we have some targets there as well, um, starting with concrete and steel. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question would be for uh, Mr. Steve. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the baseline would be based on MS1525. Uh, which version of MS1525 are you referring to? Okay, it depends on the uh, when the submissions. I mean, uh, we look into it's like, for example, the design of the building. Currently, MS1525 is the version 2000. 2019, if not mistaken. So, if the building uh, developed now by design, then it's based on this uh, MS1525. Uh, I mean, the latest versions. Yeah. For existing building, uh, we use what they call the energy consumption database. Mm. So, MS1525 is only for new building, new design. But for those uh, already exist building, uh, then in order to encourage building to reduce energy, then we use whatever existing data they have as a baseline. Uh, that is to meet the uh, what I call same methodology that uh, currently we adopt on uh, rest on the uh, Japanese method, which is currently also being uh, promoted to TC205 ISO. Because the idea of green uh, zero energy building is first to design the building as energy efficiency possible. But what happened to the existing? Because they don't have the, uh, what they call, design data. So you still, what they call existing data is a baseline. Hmm. Okay, um, since you mentioned existing buildings, is there a plan in Malaysia for uh, refurbishment of current existing buildings? Because your plan speaks of a considerable uh, em emission reduction, but I believe that an large number of uh, existing buildings in Malaysia are untouched by these plans. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I need to mention, re-mention again, uh, my presentation is based on initiative. It's not on the policy yet. But uh, the, the current government have did mention, did encourage about uh, to make building energy efficient. In fact, uh, existing building, that the government actually encouraged people to go for energy efficient. That's why the promotions of energy efficient building, energy management, they're giving out what they call energy audit conditional grant for building owner to what they call make the building uh, energy field. But before that, they need to do it systematically. Energy audit actually is the tools to identify the potentials and after that, retrofit it according to the study of the energy audit with the cost and so on. I mean, they, they can plan on that. Yeah. But at this moment, there's no compulsory by the government, even the local authorities, to make building retrofit. Not at this moment. Except for those big building or a big industry that fall under the efficient management of energy efficiency regulations 2008 under the energy commissions, they required the building to have first energy manager, energy management committee, and measures to reduce energy. That's all. But if you look into these uh, regulations for big building, 
reduce energy is many way. One of the way actually is fine tuning awareness, but there's a limit, maybe just 10%. But beyond that with that is the retrofitting. So they need to have plan on that. So later on, when the Energy Efficiency Conservation Act uh, gazetted by the government, maybe the, the plan maybe next year, under the act also it mentioned about similar, but uh, what they call, uh, it's only about the reductions to reduce energy. But how you do it, it must be uh, what they call systematic. Uh, although they didn't mention retrofitting, but if you want to achieve something, you cannot do by fine tuning or energy management, so the next level is retrofitting, something like that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. T. Hmm. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go into a, a full loop. Um, AR Han, uh, you mentioned about um, improving IEQ and even uh, IEQ and IAQ of buildings. Um, how is it implemented in, um, you, you, sorry, not hospitals, but hospitality? Uh, do you see a trend in uh, hosp hospitality industry in Singapore incorporating uh, biophilic features in their design? Sorry, I think you're muted. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, as was demonstrated in a couple of the uh, earlier examples, um, that, that indeed would be, would be true. And uh, there's also uh, different modes Please. of research. Can you hear me? Are you Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, can I continue? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there, there are also different modes of research um, on uh, internal filtration uh, of air. I mean, through various uh, finishes uh, in, in in the interiors as well, including having uh, indoor plants and these kinds of things. Yeah. So I think it's it's going to be a trend that's um, that's gonna it's gonna continue. Do you see an uh, increase of um, regulatory uh, needs for indoor air quality in in, in terms of um, future proofing for COVID or future pandemics? Yes. Um, so as as a matter of fact, I think the uh, BCA in Singapore they've they've actually released guidelines on um, refreshing the uh, uh, fresh air within. Uh, interiors for air conditioned buildings and also promoting the use of mechanical ventilation uh, as much as possible. So there, there are guidelines around how frequently um, the internal or the interior air needs to be purged and uh, when fresh air needs to be drawn um, for areas of large uh, congregation, you know, um, having the air sort of purged um, before and after each event, for instance. And I imagine that will also trickle down into um, in, in your question, uh, guest rooms uh, eventually. So yes, de definitely. Uh, although this would, I think, be also a response towards um, the nature of uh, the various variants of, of the COVID virus. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, going back to our last presenter, uh, Mr. Darren. Uh, so in, in Malaysia, currently uh, energy modeling, it's it's not as, uh, I guess, widely taken up compared to Australia or even the UK. And uh, for green building certification, at least for green RE's certification, uh, energy modeling is only a requirement for our platinum and gold. So it is a quite a, a new area that we are, we are trying to push, but it is still a very slow um, direct, uh, movement towards that direction. So how do you, uh, but it's obvious that uh, there's so much of room for improvement that you can see by utilizing energy modeling. Uh, so how do you think, um, how do you think uh, other than green building certification, how is it uh, applicable for buildings that are moving towards uh, net zero? Sorry, what, could you go explain that, sorry? How is energy modeling? Sorry, uh, I'll uh, re summarize what I said. Yeah. So, we're looking, it's not very much uh, taken up by uh, projects that are not going for green certification. And you can only see it in gold and even only gold and platinum level certification. So, uh, how would you encourage uh, projects that are 
there are not gold and platinum to take up uh, NG modeling? Well, I suppose it's down to the fact that uh, you can model your building a little bit more realistically uh, as well uh, using a package uh, like our, you can make better predictions and perhaps by doing the modeling at the, the front end, you can save on doing changes later on in the project. Uh, so uh, we, we also model things like uh, PPD and PMV and other part things as well as uh, net zero and uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, so uh, it can be used for uh, multiple reasons. Uh, how do you encourage people to use it? Uh, that comes down to regulation and things like that, I guess. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, in, in, uh, in Malaysia, I think only certain local authorities have made it a mandatory requirement for buildings to, to uh, take up green building certification. So as also mentioned by Mr. Steve, a lot of um, regulations in Malaysia are voluntary at this stage. Um, okay, uh, uh, sorry, Miss Yvonne, a uh, question for you. Um, um, looking at uh, COVID and future pandemics, um, I believe WGBC has come up with a, a number of uh, statements about uh, incorporating um, indoor air quality and indoor environmental quality for occupants in their, in their, um, in their regulations. Is SGBC also looking at that for Greenmark's future evolving plant? Yep, uh, I think for COVID uh, measures, right? Uh, for Singapore Green Building Council, uh, a lot of the advisories that we have been um, sharing um, are more from ASHRAE. I think ASHRAE has got very good um, information on how to deal with it. And then as uh, Zahan mentioned just now, uh, I think it was just last month, the BCA and uh, the other agencies came up with some guidance on uh, the air exchange rates for buildings, um, you know, installing me mechanical ventilations if you um, don't have a fresh air intake in your buildings and things like that. So at that point in time, I think it costs... Uh, a lot, a whole flurry of uh, activity, you know, because it was made a public and you have members of the public even asking, you know, what's the mechanical ventilation? Is my building safe and all that? So I think uh, for indoor air quality, that is uh, very, very well um, addressed and um, taken very seriously here. So lots of things I think have become uh, mandatory learning from uh, all global best practices. Yeah. Thank you. Um, because it is very interesting because um, I guess uh, even Green RE, we're looking into incorporating some of these elements into our certification tool in the next couple of months. Mm. So it is. Uh, yeah. So if I may add, uh, the very interesting thing is, you know, for the World Green Building Council, they have three North Star goals uh, climate action, health and well being and resources and circularity. And uh, each of these have a global project. And the one on health and well-being, and this was way you know, slightly before COVID, you know, when, we were, when they were discussing about what green buildings are supposed to deliver, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, public health. And at that time, uh, I was like one of those that was uh, objecting and you know, debating with the World Green Building Council team about you know, what's the connection between buildings and public health, you know? Because uh, in our markets, uh, we tend to look mostly at the commercial outcomes. You know, our members are mostly developers, building owners. So a lot of the time, the green building certification schemes look at you know, increasing value, um, uh, making commercial spaces better. We don't really look at the, 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 the mass public health, public housing, and those sorts of things, which the health and well-being framework of the World Green Building Council uh, sought to address. So um, it's been really interesting uh, to be, for, for, for the Singapore Green Building Council to be part of a global community and uh, looking at, you know, what some of the best practices we can bring to Singapore. Yeah, so 
it's a good point that you mentioned about the World Green Building Council. Yeah, yeah. they do have a slightly different sort of metrics for green building, which is uh, very progressive, I must say. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I missed out a question earlier from Mr. Steve, uh, bringing it back to Malaysia. Uh, I think in the last couple of months, uh, DBKL, which is uh, the KL Local Authority, they proposed a 30% energy replacement in new buildings in KL. So I guess the big question that's in, on everyone's mind on developers' uh, discussion plate, is this even possible? It is possible but depend on uh, how the consultant designed it. <clears throat> uh, putting uh, what I call renewable energy, I mean, increasing to 30% is not just putting renewable energy. The equation is, they, they mentioned about percentage, meaning to say percentage of RE is total installation of RE divided by total consumption. So the logic there is first you increase the capacity, Second, you need to reduce the demand, the consumption. So by reducing the consumption, it will increase the percentage. You got what I mean? This is where the energy efficiency must come in. You got what I mean? Uh, so when mentioned about 30% renewable energy, not just putting renewable energy or solar. Uh, back again, the first speaker had mentioned it. My slide also did mention there are a few speakers. Renewable energy must come together with energy efficiency. You, you look at the bucket just now, how you want to maintain the water level, whether lower or higher, it depends on, first, you must address the leakages. The same, the 30% requirement cannot be done just putting renewable energy. You must have the energy efficiency to lower down the consumption. And on top of that, rooftop is not enough, but the, the facade can be done. There's a consultant in Malaysia has done the analysis. It is possible. But of course, there's a limit. Everything has a limit. Tall building with small roof ratio maybe not be able to achieve it. But normal building that bigger, what they call ratio, a roof over the total area can have it. Mm. Okay. Thank you. That's an yeah. optimistic viewpoint on, uh, on BBKL's new uh, announcement. Um, so there's also one more question for you. Um, Ms. Rukaya would like to know, what is your opinion in NEM 2.0 for developer quota, which has been discontinued? Okay, this is about policy. <laughs> okay, yeah. there's another team handling that, but uh, since uh, you asked this question, the net energy metering, NEM 2.0, is already uh, what they call close, meaning to say, now the government introduced net energy metering 3.0. So the requirement for uh, 2.0 is already over. So quota for developer currently is not available because the past, what I call uh, offer to NAM 2.0, from what I understand from uh, the renewable energy team saying that there's no applications. There's no application from the developer. So uh, the policy had decided under the net 3.0, what I call uh, is not available. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have quite a number of developers actually in our audience. I hope someone would, mm -hmm. would want to say something about the NEM 3.0. But if not, I will go on to a, another question also yeah. for Steve. Yeah. Can, can I add something on that? Yes. NEM metering, NEM the application actually is uh, for those who want to install solar and have a chance to export to the grid. Okay, but for those who want to install solar for self-consumption without exporting the grid, just for own consumptions, they can proceed anytime because the Energy Commission's guideline have not what they call uh, limit that unless uh, uh, you exporting to grid. Uh, because when once you export to the grid, need to protect the grid because any disturbance to the grid will uh, have a risk to the, the to the, the the what they call the grid system. But if you just for your own consumption without exporting to a grid, I mean, they, they can install it. So the developer can design the installation of solar photovoltaic. The capacity is just nice for own consumption without exporting to the grid. If that's the case, no problem. Because the current green building in Malaysia, they do the same. They install solar photovoltaic and so on. Uh, that is, but not under net energy metering program. You got what I mean? Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. If self consumption, they can proceed. But of course, not more than 72 kilowatt. If more than 72 kilowatt and above, meaning to say it's already fall under the, uh, the guideline, you, they need to apply to Energy Commission because they need to apply license to generate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's one more question for you. Okay. Um, so far, is there any recommendations for product to building structural element? So any product uh, recommendations for your building structural element to call our member to comply with ZEB requirements? So far, there's no specific because uh, under the Malaysian standard MS1525, it's only mentioned about performance. So what type of materials that suitable to meet the performance, the consultant, the architect, they need to determine what is the material suitable. If I'm, I'm referring to the building material, uh, but if, uh, yeah, I'm referring to building material. Yeah. It can be, for example, the wall, it can be uh, erected concrete blocks with certain uh, thickness to, to what I call to reduce the heat gain. It can be a sandwich with the, uh, what they call uh, material so that, but so that uh, it can be used. But the thing is, it's up to the building designer to select what is the suitable material as long it meet the performance. So uh, we cannot just mention uh, what material, but at the end, maybe the performance different. That's why the, the speaker number four just now mentioned about building simulations. So building simulation is important to predict the energy consumption of the building by having, say, for example, the wall instead of concrete blocks. If they change to uh, erected concrete block, for example, what is the reduction of heat penetration to the building in order to reduce the air condition demand or certain thickness? They can play around with the simulations or because in the every material have thermal conductivity. So like, for example, uh, the bricks have different, wool have different, a styrofoam have different, or whatever. So when they do mix in sandwich, also can have a further reduction and so on. But all this must be simulated according to the software. And then the result from the software into uh, of the selection of the material will be become a result what material you want to use. So that is uh, uh, the, the, the answer from my side. Maybe the, the persons, uh, the speaker number four, uh, Darren Bentley can elaborate further. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Steve, there's a number of couple more questions for you on the chat group. Perhaps you can um, answer them while I look back to the other speakers. Okay, uh, since we are reaching uh, 5 p.m., uh, perhaps I could ask uh, each speaker to sum up uh, from your presentation. So if you have any last words to share with our audience today. Um, Yvonne? Uh, maybe I take the opportunity to answer uh, one of the questions in the chat about whether um, Singapore has explored other sources of renewable energy. Yep. Um, so we've tried a wind, but you know the wind speed in Singapore is just uh, far too low. I think for wind turbines, you need about 4.5 meters per second and our average is about 2 meters per second. So it doesn't really work out. So even though there's been like companies uh, doing the small little wind turbines where you can put at the exit point of uh, aircon um, ventilation fans, right? Uh, Singapore, we already incinerate all our waste. So it's waste to energy that already generates uh, 2 to 3% of uh, Singapore's energy requirements currently. And then everything else like tidal is not possible because, um, you know, the sea is too calm and uh, the shipping lanes are probably too busy. Our rivers are like super tiny, so hydro power also not possible. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I thought, okay, I'll just uh, respond to that question. Yeah, but um, overall, I think there seems to be very good momentum and interest in uh, zero energy, working towards zero energy building. So I think uh, that is a really good uh, move. And um, if there's uh, any other further questions or um, requests for information, please uh, feel free to contact the Singapore Green Building Council. We'll be most happy to share resources. Yep. Thank you uh, for having me at this uh, session today. 
Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, it, it certainly is uh, interesting to see how far Singapore has come since we last had you with us in our Green Bill conference. So it's uh, we're definitely happy to have you on board. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Steve, do you have any uh, summation of uh, your presentation? So I think uh, I've been mentioned during the, the slide, but uh, what uh, I would like to say here is, if you wanted to go uh, zero energy building, you no need to wait uh, until people do it. Uh, you can start. I mean, uh, for those who can afford to do it, just proceed. Just proceed. Uh, because uh, the earlier you start, uh, meaning to say you are leading and also champion what they call the, the, the implementations. So uh, if you cannot get 100% zero, but you can start at least 50%, <laughs> that is the message that we try to say. And uh, for the new building as well as the existing building. Okay, thank you. Uh, A.R. Han? Hi, yeah, just want to thank um, everyone uh, in this room for a very enlightening afternoon. I've learned a lot uh, from our uh, neighbors in Malaysia. Um, and at the same time, there's always a bit of envy, right? And the um, vast amount of resource and um, different typologies uh, that you have in your building crop as well. I think I'd like to take this opportunity to um, sort of, I think, open up um, uh, our, our little platform in uh, Singapore of Institute of Architects for um, a bit of cross-border sharing of ideas, of strategies as well. I think we all stand to benefit uh, as a larger region. And um, instead of just looking at net zero buildings, um, hopefully uh, we can also start looking at other modes of um, preservation of, uh, in this case, uh, natural ecosystems and so on. Because uh, climate change is only one of many issues uh, with regard to sustainability that we'll be facing. On the SIA Green Book, um, you can visit the website. Um, I will put it on the, on the chat window and um, feel free to download um, a free copy. And hopefully some of these principles uh, would also be helpful, yeah, um, not mandated, <laughs> but helpful uh, for how you look at um, architecture and buildings uh, in Malaysia as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mr. Darren, finally. Again, thank you very much for inviting me. It'd be very interesting to see what both Singapore and Malaysia do uh, to attain net zero. Uh, I suppose, as the other speakers have said, net zero isn't just about renewables and modeling renewables. It's about passive design. It's about putting in that uh, different types of walls and seeing what happens. It's about lighting. It's about uh, shading and things like that. And that's where simulation can come into play. You can try all these things first and see how they improve. But yes, it, it's more than just renewables. You can do things uh, with passive design as well. So thank you. Okay, um, thank you all. I have uh, I've posted the link to a survey form for post uh, webinar um, survey. I hope everyone has spent two minutes to fill it up. And uh, once again, Green RE would like to thank all our speakers for sharing their last two hours with us and all the attendees that have uh, once again uh, joined us for our Sustainability Awareness Web Drive webinars. And uh, we hope to see you in the next one that should be, uh, should be organized in uh, August. And uh, I guess the takeaway message from our webinar today is that there's so much of uh, opportunities, there's so much of uh, potential technologies to be incorporated in our building design, so much of uh, resources available, such as energy modeling uh, and even um, policies that and uh, goals that have been put in place by local authorities and uh, set up. And uh, there's so much uh, more that we can do for our buildings. So uh, let's, uh, let's look into areas where we can work together and synergize our efforts towards uh, these goals. So uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, guys. Bye-bye. Yep. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Uh, by the way, the presentation slides, uh, if uh, agreeable by all our speakers, 
uh, it will be made available on our website. Okay, yeah, good, good, very good, very good. Because a lot of people asking me, they are missing what they call this event halfway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'll check with the rest and, and post it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>